perfect. Welcome, everybody. Let's see. If you could please give me a thumbs up just to make sure that um, you can hear and the audio is working. And um, you should all be muted uh, upon entry, but just in case, have a, just, just double check that you are muted um, to ensure that there's no extra background noise. Thank you so much. It's a couple of thumbs up there. We'll just wait another minute, see if there's any more people coming through and we'll get started very shortly. Okay, I think I will just let people in as they come. Um, welcome to our pelvic floor uh, lecture. This is um, the last of Ellen's six part pelvic, pelvic floor lecture, lecture series. Um, my name is Renee Westmacott and I am your host for the evening. Um, the topic for tonight's lecture is the link between pelvic floor and urinary sy symptoms. For those of you who are new to Ellen's pelvic floor lectures, Ellen has been hard at work getting the word out regarding a variety of pelvic floor issues, all from a physiotherapist perspective. If you have been with us all along, thank you. We trust that this lecture has been informative and helped you understand how the pelvic floor functions. We are grateful for your support and attention. A little bit about Ellen. Ellen has been with AST for many years now. Uh, she started as a clinic assistant and then transitioned to one of our expert physiotherapists. As you have come to learn, Ellen has a keen interest in pelvic floor related issues. Um, if you have any questions during the lecture, feel free to write them into the chat box. Um, I will be watching for them. If the questions are relevant at the moment, I will interrupt Ellen and ask them for you. If not, we can review all the questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, please note that pelvic floor issues have the potential to be sensitive in their nature. And if you have any questions, but would like to ask in private manner, feel free to change your name on Zoom. Ellen will explain how to do that shortly. When the lecture is over, feel free to stay on the call and ask any further questions. That's all for now. Uh, please welcome, or please join me in welcoming Mrs. Ellen Wittemeyer, physiotherapist at Active Sports Therapy. Welcome, Ellen. Thanks, Renee. I'm going to share my screen here. Mm -hmm. All right. So, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Um, and today we're looking at kind of the bowels and how they connect to urinary symptoms. So this is actually a topic that came up when I was going through my training and was a really big light bulb moment for me and some of the people in my life. So I thought it was really important to do a lecture on this one because for some people, urinary symptoms such as incontinence or urgency can actually be resolved simply by looking at bowel issues. So. That is what we're gonna be discussing today. Now, like Renee said, anonymity can be really important to many people. So if you do wanna change your name, what you can do is uh, on your screen in the top right corner, there's gonna be a little three dots. If you click on that and click, select, I believe it's rename, um, you can change your name to anything. And that is the name that's gonna be coming up in the chat box if you do ask a question. So if you do want to do it anonymously, don't worry that everyone will know who you are. If it just says anonymous or your initials or anything like that, that is what's going to pop up. So please ask any questions and my email will be at the end of the presentation as well. So if you have a personal question or it's, it's very specific, feel free to email me at any time. All right, so we'll get right into it, the bowels. If you hear the bowels, the intestines, or the colon, that's technically all synonymous. That's the same thing. So if you hear me use any of them interchangeably, that's why. But also when you hear about doctors or nurses or anyone else saying the same thing, they are all technically the same. Usually the colon is just the large intestine. 
So if we take a look at this picture, what happens is food comes into the stomach and then it travels through all of these little guys through an action called peristalsis. So we have little muscles lining the little walls of our entire intestinal system. And those muscles are completely out of our control. They're just like the heart muscle or the little muscles in your pupils. We can't control it even if we want to, but it will actually push the food or matter along through the whole tract. And that's like I said, called peristalsis through smooth muscle contractions. It can take anywhere from 24 to 42 to 72, sorry, hours to actually go through that whole system, which is a really large uh, range, I guess. And that's why some people with food sensitivities can sometimes feel a little bit bloated for multiple days on end if things aren't exactly moving quickly. And the way that the intestinal tract works is that specific areas throughout that tract are designed to absorb different things. So we'll go through kind of specifically what happens in the bowels. So it comes out of the stomach and right into the duodenum or duodenum, which is part of that small intestine tract. Now the small intestine is small in diameter, which is why it's called small, but it's incredibly long. It's six to eight meters long. And it is responsible for most probably about 75 or more percent of actual nutrition absorption and most liquid absorption. So that is where that real kind of digestive portion of, I guess the absorption portion of our digestion happens. So small intestine, very, very important. Once we hit the large intestine, it is significantly shorter. It's only two meters and it kind of surrounds the rest of the digestive tract. And that is where the final absorption happens. That is where we store the matter until it kind of builds up and it's time to expel. And we also process it so it's ready for expulsion. This is where all of those little gut flora, all those yogurt commercials about probiotics talking about the good bacteria, our good bacteria is hanging out in that large intestine where we want everything to kind of get cleaned up. Let's get the last of the absorption and get it ready to get out of there. Now, once it passes through the large intestine, it will come into the rectum. And we have really specific nerves in the rectum that can feel when it stretches. So as soon as matter comes into that rectum, we're gonna get a little bit of stretching. And those nerves go directly to the brain telling us that something is there and it is time to expel it. What's really cool is the nerves and the internal anal sphincter can actually tell us whether it is stool or whether it is gas. And that's why we can tell, right? When you kind of feel like, ooh, something's coming, we know almost always what is what. And that's because the nerves can actually communicate that to the brain. Now, the anal sphincters, we have two of them. And that's really important because the, the anal sphincters are the last kind of gateway before coming out into the world. And the internal one is what we consider involuntary. So we have no control over that. That is the one that's telling us kind of whether there's stool or gas, and it is in general going to help us remain continent. And then we have the external anal sphincter, and that one is under our control. That is what we are kind of squeezing shut when we're trying to hold in gas or we're trying to make it to the bathroom. So it's important that we know that we have involuntary and voluntary because in my world, we can help to kind of strengthen and control that external sphincter if we ever have any issues. So that is kind of that digestive system as a whole. Now, a lot of people talk about being normal or regular in bowel movements. And a lot of people also think that once a day is kind of that average, but that's actually not true. You can be completely regular and completely normal if you move your bowels three times a day or if you move your bowels three times a week. And so everyone is a little bit different. It's based on what you're eating. It's based on your gut flora and how that peristalsis, those muscle contractions are working. Are you healthy? How old are you? There's so many different factors. So instead of kind of comparing yourself to your sister who mentioned that she 
goes once a day, it's more important that we're actually looking at your stool and your stool consistency. So stool consistency is the best way to kind of know if things are healthy or go in the right direction. And it is very much affected by your diet. Um, sometimes if we have more or less fiber, it's definitely going to change. And I think that's something that a lot of people have heard is that fiber is very important in digestion. Um, and there's two different types. And I am admittedly not an expert. You're going to look at more of a dietitian, nutritionist, a naturopath looking into the diet side of things, but there are different effects in soluble versus insoluble fiber. But you're also going to see things like fats um, and the so high fats and oils affecting stool consistency, how much you're drinking. There's a whole bunch of different factors. But if you look at the Bristol stool chart, it's a really important one for knowing if you are normal or healthy. So generally, when we are having a bowel movement that is not um, connected, there's a problem in either direction. So if there are really hard separate clumps, usually we're looking at the constipation side. Whereas if it is very, very soft and clumpy, we're looking more on that diarrheal side. And both of those are a sign that something is wrong. I can't tell you for sure what's, what's wrong or what's going on, but either we aren't digesting properly, diet isn't appropriate, or we're having some other health issues that are affecting the gut. So we generally want to hang out in an area where our bowel movements are connected. It's okay if we have some lines and some lumps within that kind of connected sausage shaped bowel movement, or if it's completely smooth, but we do want it to generally be that sausage shape. And more importantly, we want it to come out easily or relatively easily. When we are straining and pushing, that's generally a sign that something is going on. Now, obviously diarrhea, as I mentioned, is not a good thing, but I'm gonna focus more on that constipation side because like I said at the beginning, I do wanna talk about that connection with bowel movements and urinary issues and having constipation increases the chance of urinary issues. So what constipation is specifically is it's that it's infrequent and or uncomfortable bowel movements. So remembering that that frequency is different for everyone, but say you're used to having a bowel movement twice a day and that is kind of your normal. And then all of a sudden you're only doing having one every two days and it is very uncomfortable. We're straining to pass it. Then that is likely considered constipation. And you can check out that Bristol stool chart. With constipation, we also generally have other symptoms such as bloating or distension of the abdomen where you, you physically look and feel bigger through that abdomen, that's generally a sign of constipation. And the reason that it generally happens is that the colon is absorbing too much water. So like I mentioned, we have those muscles that are pushing things through that entire digestive system. And if it is going too slowly for whatever reason, then all of that absorption in the small intestine and especially that large intestine, it just keeps on absorbing that water. So the mass that's already happening is now taking that fluid out of it, which makes it harder, which makes it then move more slowly and it kind of cycles. And then it's very difficult to pass. So that is these guys up here, anything that is really hard. Now, generally what we see is that if we have a really low fiber diet, it tends to slow down that mass. So adding, I believe it's insoluble fiber can actually help to increase the mass and increase the speed in which we are digesting and passing any kind of matter. And exercise is part of it as well. So if you aren't moving, that will also slow down that digestive system. So that might be a small kind of light bulb moment for some people because Oftentimes when we are in our normal routine, maybe, maybe you walk every day or you walk from the train to your work building or you have a dog that you take out every day. It doesn't need to be this high intensity exercise, but if we have that normal movement, we tend to be a little bit more regular digestive wise, but then maybe on the weekends or if people are taking a break or all of a sudden they're working from home and not moving as much, there is an increased chance that we'll see that constipation or that irregularity in through those bowel movements. So 
the bowels and the pelvic region. That is why we are here. And the reason that the bowels and especially urinary symptoms are so connected is because they are so close together. So if we look at our picture here, first one, those are the penis. We literally have our colon sitting right beside our bladder. So if we have increased mass hanging out in here, growing and becoming bigger, becoming distended, it can actually physically push against the bladder, which is going to make you feel like you have to pee. You might have some urgency. You might have weird urinary feelings where you, where you really have to go or you can't go. And that can be literally because they're right beside each other and they can put pressure through that area. Same with women. We do have that vagina uterus hanging out in between the bowel and the bladder, but a lot of the pictures, I was trying to find a really good one. It's very deceiving because this looks like there's quite a bit of space in there, but if the vagina is not full, it is simply two little walls that are hanging out just like this. So if you have your rectum on one side and your bladder hanging out on the other side, they're actually still quite close and they can still affect each other. What we also see in that connection is that chronic straining increases risk of urinary incontinence. And if you ignore the entire rest of this lecture, this is what is super important, is that if we are straining to pass, especially a bowel movement, and we're getting that really strong downward pressure, your pelvic floor as a whole is going to be affected by that because everything kind of comes together as a sling, like looking at this red muscle looking object on this picture, we can consider the pelvic floor basically like that little bowl at the bottom. And the muscles work like this. They start at the pubic bone and they at least wrap around the rectum and come back. So it is going to affect multiple areas within that perineal region, not just the back. So if we are consistently straining and pushing and holding our breath in order to pass any kind of stool, what happens is the brain learns that it is supposed to push through any kind of pelvic floor strength or tension. And that's all fine and dandy when you're trying to have a bowel movement, but it's really not so great when you're trying to hold in your pee. Because now you have taught your brain that, that we push through that, that's fine. And so all of a sudden we're gonna be pushing through the little sphincters and slings that are helping you remain continent. So that is something that definitely needs to be resolved if someone is having urinary symptoms, but it's something that tends to be overlooked. We'll see a lot of pelvic floor muscle training and urge training and neurological training and all of that. But if you still continue to push through that appropriate pelvic floor contraction or tension, then that's all for naught. And I wouldn't want anyone wasting their time. So sometimes you need to resolve the bowel stuff before you can kind of tackle that urinary issue or it could help resolve that urinary issue. What we also see is that if we are having bowel issues, we are changing urinary or toileting habits for the brain. So if anyone watched my, I believe it was in the urinary incontinence lecture, what I was talking about was how quickly our bladders form habits where we can kind of put the key in the door and all of a sudden we have to pee or if we run to the bathroom that we have to go right away. That is all habit forming. But also if you are consistently going to the toilet because you're having diarrheal issues or you know that you're supposed to pass something and you've been constipated for three days and, and you're like going to sit on the toilet every once in a while just because, yes, that is really good for the bowels, but you're also likely going to pee every time you go to do that. And so all of a sudden you're creating other urinary issues that weren't necessarily there or a problem in the first place because you're getting so used to going to the toilet every time you see it or going just in case. And we know that we don't want to be doing just in case keys. And I don't know, it might be different for guys. I can't say that I've experienced it, but I know for many women, as soon as you sit on a toilet, even if you don't feel like you have to pee, you are probably going to at least urinate a little bit. And so we can start to create those inappropriate habits. 
Another reason why the bowels are so kind of interrelated with the pelvic region is that the bowels actually have their own little muscle. It's called the cuborectalis, and it is this sling. You see it in the picture here. This is a really lovely picture. And it, it starts on the, the pubic bone right in front, and it actually just loops around the bottom of our rectum. And this is incredibly important because it helps us with continence. So even if you have maybe runny stool or something that is at risk of leaking, it is kinked so that everything has to kind of move up or laterally in order to come out, which is fantastic. It's our body has really, it's given us multiple sphincters. It's given us a special muscle. It is trying its absolute hardest to keep you continent in the bowels, which is awesome. Except that the way that we tend to have bowel movements, especially in kind of North American culture, is that we don't actually allow this muscle to relax. And so that's something I'm going to talk about very shortly in toileting position, because if we don't allow this muscle to actually relax, then we're going to be pushing through it. And that's the exact same issue as what I was talking about, trying to push through that pelvic floor. And all of a sudden we can lose appropriate control of that muscle, or it can affect um, kind of the strength of that muscle. What we also see is that if we generally have weakness in through the pelvic floor for whatever reason, it includes this muscle as well. So it might not be helping us remain continent the same way as it would when it is nice and strong. It's not pulling in that same way. So this one is really important. Oh, and I didn't think to mention this until right now. Whether you are male or female, our urethra goes right through here. So this muscle actually loops around both of them to get in through the bowels. I just totally lied. That's for females only. But your urethra is right in between this muscle. And so if we have issues with it, we will likely have issues with general urinary incontinence. So we have such a strong connection between the bowels and the bladder and urinary symptoms. All right, so I'm sure it's obvious, I've kind of said it or alluded to it a few times, we really wanna make sure that we have figured out our digestion and our bowel movements, if there's any kind of urinary symptoms, because there's a chance that they are related. I am not gonna guarantee it. Sometimes they are completely separate, but as this picture nicely shows, they are so close and they impact each other so much. So we can do things right away to kind of start that process of sorting out our bowel issues. And the very first and most important one is to decrease strain. I basically teach this position to almost everyone that walks through the door, because if we strain, hemorrhoids become an issue. So especially if anyone is pregnant or has been pregnant and has ended up with hemorrhoids, any kind of straining is going to increase them. It's going to push them out. It's going to make them angry. So we want to decrease strain. We want to decrease strain if anyone has any bowel issues in general. If there's any kind of prolapse, we don't want to be straining. We definitely don't want to be straining if we have urinary issues because we don't want to be pushing through those muscles. I think you guys get the point. Strain, not good. So in order to decrease that, our positioning is key. So whenever we toilet, number one, feet should always be fat, flat on the ground. That is super important. A stool is preferred. And in this picture, we can kind of see. So this is that little muscle that I just talked about, that little sling that's around the rectum, just kinking the rectum. So we are simply sitting, and this person is sitting with their knees above their hips already, which is ideal. But sometimes for shorter people on taller toilets, we're actually at a level. And so that's still going to be even more kinked in through the rectum. As soon as we add a stool, and this is the squatty potty. We have squatty potties in the clinic. I have them at home. I recommend them to everyone, but the squatty potty itself is not the be all end all. It's the fact that it is a stool. So anything that will raise your feet above just flat ground and so that your knees are above the hips is very helpful. So I'm not endorsing the squatty potty specifically. It's just a handy one because it wraps around your toilet. But what it's doing is it is bringing our hip angle to about 30 degrees. 
And 30 degrees is that beautiful window where we are no longer kinking the rectum and everything can come out so much more easily. And so then you're not having to push down and strain and create pressure in through the abdomen. So that angle is absolutely number one. Now at home, it's easier to kind of jig things up, but if you're in public or like in a, in a public restroom, then what you can do is bring yourself forward so that your forearms are resting on your thighs. When we're doing that, we're still kind of helping out that angle. So this person's chest would be a little bit farther down here. So we would still be around that 30 degree angle. It's not as helpful, but it's definitely good in a pinch and can help us reduce that pain. So knees above hips and really way above hips is awesome. Then not only is positioning important, breathing is really important. Again, if you've uh, listened to other lectures, I think the core lecture is where I really get into that connection of the pelvic floor with breath. But if you are taking nice deep inhales and exhales, we can help to relax that pelvic floor. Now, for those that have learned your breathing, have done your breathing and can kind of connect that piston of diaphragm and pelvic floor, what we want to do is we want to focus on that inhale and relax that pelvic floor, but we're never squeezing the pelvic floor on an exhale or at any time when we're sitting on a toilet. We don't want to create those habits because again, it confuses the brain. All of a sudden it's closing things off when they're supposed to be relaxing and it's just chaos down there. So you're inhaling and relaxing and then just exhaling and then back to inhale, relax and open and just basic exhale. That can be really helpful for cueing the brain to release all those muscles in and around that rectum to allow things to come out a little bit more easily. If positioning and breath doesn't make things happen nice and smooth, then what you can do is do a few little pelvic movements. So you can tilt your pelvis forward and back, thinking sticking your tail out and bringing pubic bone down towards the floor. I'm doing it, but you can't see me and then tucking your tail under. Back and forth, not squeezing the pelvic floor at any point, but sometimes simply moving back and forth can kind of loosen things up, get things going, get that peristalsis, that muscle movement going. And then if that doesn't work, what you can do is blow into a closed fist. So if you feel like I have to strain, then this is when you're gonna close your fist and you're actually gonna blow into it. That way we're at least breathing, but still creating that pressure that your body so desperately wants in order to push things out of there. So if you feel like you're gonna strain and nothing else is working, blow into a closed fist. Try it. It's kind of a weird one to wrap your head around, but it does help. What you can also do is rotate to the right. And this is kind of a funky one, but when we think of, actually, I'm gonna go back a little bit to our little digestive system here. So the food or, or our matter will actually go up the right side through our ascending colon, past the appendix, up through here. It goes right across and then it comes down our left side. And that is in almost everyone in the population. You see the occasional Gray's Anatomy episode where people are mirrored or flipped, but for most people, it's going to go up the right, across, and down the left. So what that means is if we come up and reach over our right shoulder, what we're doing is we're actually wringing out the left side of that, that descending colon to try and kind of get things going down there. So you can kind of do some repetitions of reaching over that right shoulder to kind of get things moving a little bit. Now, these don't work for everyone. And sometimes if you are not in a good place with your digestion, you might have to resort to other things in order to kind of resolve constipation or, or pass those bowels. But these are good options in order to try to decrease that sitting and pushing down and holding our breath. The other thing that you can start <clears throat> immediately is to never ignore the urge. Now, this is different than the bladder. Again, if you have listened to the other lectures, Sometimes if we're peeing a lot, we want to kind of recognize and then move past that first urgency with the bladder. 
because the bladder tells us when it's partially full and then when it's full. So we wanna allow it to actually get full. The rectum is different. The rectum tells us when it's time to go. And so if we ignore that urge, which a lot of us do, what happens is it just sits in the end of the colon or in the rectum and it continues to get that water and that liquid absorbed through the colon back into, back into that bloodstream. So stool that might have been relatively easy to pass is now getting harder and harder the longer that it's staying in there. So it can then make it more difficult to pass, increase strain, and then we're going down that bad path again. So if you can, trying to listen to that urge as soon as possible. Now, that is much easier said than done. A lot of people have jobs where they can't just go. You might be a someone who works maybe at a desk, um, not a, a desk, then you might be able to go, but you might have meetings back to back to back, or you might be a cashier where you're not allowed to leave for three hours, or you might be a physio when you have back to back patients. There's so many professions and jobs where you can't necessarily just leave. But if you notice it, then if you can kind of actively try, maybe like when you're planning your breaks, trying to get it a little bit closer, um, or if you can switch with someone or whatever, it is gonna make your life so much easier the sooner that you can get to the washroom and move your bowels when you get that urge. Now, this is easier if you are quote unquote regular. So some people know that at like 10 a.m. every day, they're gonna have a bowel movement that's so much easier because then you can try to plan your breaks around that point. Or for some people, after they have coffee is a really common one. Then you can kind of strategize your coffee so that once you do feel that urge, you're able to go to the bathroom. Again, this might be something that some people can start to actually use in their life. And some people, it's just gonna be tough. But if you at least have the knowledge, you can start to use this any way that you can. So never ignore urge to move your bowels. All right, another thing that we can do in order to sort out our bowels issues so that we can help our urinary system is looking at our diet. So like I mentioned previously, I am not a diet expert, but generally we wanna recommend a relatively balanced diet. Um, if you have sensitivities or you suspect you have sensitivities, if you are constantly bloated or getting weird stomach aches, then sometimes sensitivities are something that you're gonna to wanna to tackle first as well because they might be causing diarrhea or constipation. So that's not my forte. That's where dietitians or naturopaths are really, really helpful in helping. But also drinking enough water. If we are dehydrated and we're getting water absorbed through our colon, then there is not gonna to be too much left once you're trying to move those bowels. So, a lot of people are worried about getting their eight cups of water a day. And, and it's like a 10,000 steps a day. Like it, it's a good kind of general guideline. But what's more important, just like the stool chart, is your urine chart. So pale urine, we always want it to at least be a little bit yellow. If it is completely clear, you might be overhydrated. Um, and that just means you can back off a little bit. So tiniest pale, pale yellow is wonderful. That means that you are on the right track. As it gets darker, it's getting a little more iffy into areas where you are getting quite sick, potentially. If it's going into more of the brown ranges, um, then you need to be hydrated very quickly. So using the stool chart and using urine color can be really helpful for knowing what your body is trying to tell you. And if you are well hydrated, it is going to make passing your bowels so much easier, especially if you are more likely to have constipation if things aren't working well. And that way we're not straining and we're not creating that urinary issue. Lastly, exercise. Exercise is so important for a million things. I'm a physio, I'm a little biased, but exercise is incredibly important. But it has been proven time and time again that movement, general day-to-day -day movement, helps with bowel motility, which is movement and that muscle pulsing in through the intestines. So increased movement increases movement of the stool, which helps 
decrease that excess water absorption. So if it kind of keeps moving along, it's going to be allowing absorption of actual nutrients, but it's not going to have too much liquid absorption and it, you're still going to be able to pass it really nicely. So general Canadian guidelines, they haven't changed in years because they keep studying it and it keeps remaining appropriate. That 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity of exercise weekly is really important. And that can include a fast walk. That can include a bike ride, that can include stairs, anything like that where the heart gets pumping and the blood gets pumping, that's also going to get your intestines moving. So something to think about, again, if you are having these weird urinary symptoms and you're also noticing that you tend to be constipated, then getting moving can sometimes get everything else moving for you as well. So this is a quicker one because it was such a specific topic, but again, it's one that was a really, really big light bulb moment for me and people in my life. So I really wanted to share with everyone. And that is constipation can be a very, very large and prominent factor in urinary symptoms, including incontinence. And this is because bowel issues can create strain, can create pressure in through the pelvic floor, and can create weird habits for the, the bladder as well as the bowels. Toilet position is super, super important in order to reduce strain. So if everyone even just tries, next time you feel like you have a bowel movement, bring something in so that you can put your feet up and bring those knees above the hips. I really encourage you to try because it is a life-changing experience because everything is so much easier and you are never gonna wanna go back. Another thing, listen to the urge. If you feel like it's time to move your bowels, it's time to move your bowels. We don't have to ignore this one. This is one we really want to listen to so that we're not creating this constipation issue and then playing into those urinary symptoms. And lastly, as always, diet and exercise, very important, but allowing your body to tell you what's going on in there. Because oftentimes we don't know, and oftentimes we don't want to know what's going on down there because it probably means we shouldn't have the pizza or whatever. And we don't want to hear that. But if you can look at your stool, if you can look at your urine color and everything is looking good, then the pizza was awesome. And that is not necessarily what the issues are, right? So let your body actually tell you what it's trying to tell you. And sometimes it can help resolve symptoms that don't even seem related. So this is the email that I was talking about before. That is my personal work email. It just comes to me. No one else sees it. So if anyone has any questions or is like, hey, I'm not really sure if this is related to my case or anything like that, please feel free to reach out, ask questions. I'll shoot you an email back. And um, I'll be honest, if I think that we need to do a session, then we will. But if it's a quick answer, then I have no problem kind of helping you out a little bit. Um, that's also the AST number. Um, again, if you would rather call than email, um, if I'm in the clinic and with someone, unfortunately, I won't be able to take the call, but we can always leave a message at the front desk and I have no problem calling people back when I get this down. Now, this lecture is going to be going on to our Active Sports Therapy YouTube page, Active Sports Therapy One. And on that page are the other lectures that I kind of alluded to. Um, very, very different areas of pelvic floor, but it's really nice to kind of have them there. And I encourage people because there are those little tidbits that people can start right away. And I would really, really love more people to know those little facts and less people to have issues through that pelvic floor. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, you've put a lot of work into getting a lot of information out um, about pelvic floor uh, from a physio's perspective. And uh, I know I'm grateful and I'm sure all of the followers are as well. Um, is there any questions that came up during the talk? Um, if there is, feel free to speak up or you can put them into the notes. Um, I know something came up with me and it was linked actually to travel and an experience with the squatty potty. We had traveled overseas into India yeah. and uh, came back home and it was a very drastic um, toilet experience. And uh, I bought the squatty potty 
Um, <laughs> yeah, as soon as we got home, I couldn't believe the function, um, the functionality of, of using my body properly. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be aligned with Ellen on looking into a stool or squatting potty. <laughs> oh, I love it. And that's the thing is there's a lot of people like a lot of Asian cultures still do the full squat and that's what our body was built to do, right? That is what we are made for. And so those full squats, that is the way to go. And unfortunately our toilets are just too comfortable. Yes. <laughs> so we need to do other things to get into that position. So I love it. That's fantastic. Um, I just have a couple of thank yous. Um, I'll read it out. Thank you for the series. I have really learned a lot and have been able to practice some of these uh, good practices that you've listed. Um, I will say one more time to follow up on Ellen. Uh, call active sports therapy. So there's going to be a bit of a differentiator now, active oh, sports yeah. therapy, Willow park versus active sports theory, West active sports therapy, Westman village. Ellen, you are staying at Willow park and yeah. that is your primary practice. Um, and, uh, so the number to get in touch with Ellen or to book an appointment is that Willow park number that we've known for the last 10 plus years. Um, all, um, all pelvic floor assessments need to be booked on phone, on the phone, not actually yeah. online. And, um, I think that's all for tonight. Yay. And I think that's all for the winter 21, 22, uh, pelvic floor lecture series. So thank you so much for everything, Ellen. Um, thank you for everyone who participated. Um, if you watched, uh, this video, live or any of the lectures live or if you saw them on YouTube. Um, we are grateful for the support and we appreciate Ellen getting all this information about pelvic floor out into the world. It's very important. Um, I'm not seeing any more uh, messages so I think we can sign off for the evening. All right. Thank you everyone. Thank you Ellen and thank you everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Leave that meeting, sorry. <laughs>